Hello, everybody. Um, today we're going to be tackling a topic that I know a lot of people have been wanting me to tackle, and that's basically, I get a lot of messages saying, well, don't you think Dragon Ball Super is trash? Don't you think they don't understand these characters at all? Don't you think they're turning them into nothing more than a joke and pointless filler, and that everything that we've got in this fan service... Well, to answer your question, no, no, and kinda. Uh, <laughs> okay, here's what I mean. Um, I'm going to say right now, I don't think it was trash. I completely disagree with this incredibly ridiculous notion that they needed to skip the first two arcs. Um, I do not agree for one thing, that the Universal Tournament arc or whatever that they had was the first good arc. In fact, honestly, I think it's one of the worst Dragon Ball arcs, period. Um, and no, I do not think that they are intentionally or otherwise mischaracterizing Goku. And um, I will explain why. Uh, this, this video has been a long time coming and I, I know a lot of people wanted to hear it. And I know that a lot of folks are going to disagree with this. This is, again, this this is mostly opinion-based. Um, I will, however, be providing things to back up my opinion. But in the end, it is my opinion. I can't make you like or dislike something. So here we go. Um, I can, however, uh, <laughs> take issue with the idea that something is trash just because people don't like it. Uh... <sighs> and here we go. Alright, first and foremost, this idea that they needed to skip the first two arcs because they were already covered in the movies and we didn't need to see them again, on the surface, I can see why people would buy that. Because on the surface, when you take a look at the movies, you know, they had really good animation, uh, they were kind of the same story, uh, they, 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 you know, and when, when you see it in the series, you know, you, you, you just get the same thing, but stretched out more, and it's just, there was no point, and they could have skipped it. Um, that, that's not at all true. I'm gonna say that right now, because the movies were missing some things that definitely were in the series. Uh, and a lot of that is in terms of characterization. One thing that we definitely got in the series over the movies is we got to see how Beerus really behaved. Which I think is very important to setting up the coming conflict. And also in Toriyama storytelling. Here's the thing about Beerus. When we first see him, you know, he, he's being served a banquet on this alien planet. And just because, you know, the food was a little salty... He decided that he was going to destroy their planet. But only half, because it was a minor slip-up. You know, we, we see this planet with these cavemen-type creatures on it, where they offended him, and so he would just, this tiny little speck of energy, it looks like, just completely obliterates their world. We got to see a lot more of his temper. We got to see a lot more of his you know, actual power, and I think that was very important in establishing exactly how high the stakes were raised comparatively. Um, we do get to see a lot more character interaction, and while people want to call that fan service, when you get right down to it, everything about this series is going to be fan service. There's no dancing around that at all. I really do not know what people were expecting going into this. Um, the entire thing was going to be a fan service arc. It was just some more adventures with the gang. Why? Because they said from the announcement, from the announcement, that this was going to be set between the ending of the Majin Buu arc and the ending of the manga. That was that was the period this was going to take place in, that, that ten year gap there. So everything that we got was going to come with, you know, the end in mind that everybody was going to be alive, everybody was going to be a bit older, and we were going to see them all again. So yes, that does kind of undermine some of the tension. But 
that's the way it is. Um, the whole point, again, was because people wanted more adventures with these guys, and the thing about Toriyama is that the, the, the ending of the manga was a very Toriyama ending. And it also kind of leaves things open for other people to tell more stories, or for you, even the fans, to continue things, if you so choose, and a lot of people have. And there's been fan fiction out there, and there's been a lot of really, really bad fan fiction out there. But there's, there's also been some surprisingly good ones um, that I've actually thought were of some pretty high quality. Um, I may be in the minority in thinking Dragon Ball Multiverse is not one of them. Strongly so, in fact. But, you know, that there, there are continuations out there that people like. That... that you know, hey, and they're free to do it. They're they're not canon. They never will be canon, sure, but it doesn't matter because the entire thing was Toriyama basically giving you the, the license, the the freedom to you know make up your own stories with these guys. They're they're timeless characters. They're great, and I'm sure we'll probably see some of that in the future. What well, with the creation of this Dragon Ball room thing, though. Again, it being a Toei creative team, they're going to have a lot to prove. Because you remember what happened the last time we had a purely Toei thing. And that was uh, GT. <clears throat> but yeah. Um, it's honestly, yeah, a very fan service series by design. And I don't think it's garbage for it. Um... But I will say that I, I, I do appreciate these little tidbits because we could see a lot more of how the, the character relationships work, including the romantic ones. And one reason that I, I love that, and I do mean love it, adore it, is it just undermines so many memes that are out there about how these couples were or always were or really are or... You know, the, the, these two can't really stand each other. And, you know, these two, oh, they're all lovey-dovey behind the scenes. And, oh, these two, she she can barely admit that she cares for him. But he still loves her anyways. And, and he's learned to interpret her minute, barely there signs of love. And it's like, oh, hell no, you were wrong in all three counts. <laughs> and it was, it was, it's it's great to see that. It really is. Um, it's interesting to see how Goten and Trunks are growing up. And um, it'll be interesting to see how they go from how they are now to how they are by the end of the series. Um, especially in the case of little Goten. Oh my gosh. But, um, yeah, I... I I love that we got that, and I love that we're getting that, and I love that we got that in those two arcs, and I think we got some very important character development. Um, we got to see a realistic depiction of what would happen if somebody had to face someone who had essentially brutally murdered them before, which is something that honestly was always just kind of glossed over in the main series. But we finally got to see it here, and that is that... We got to see Krillin experience some PTSD. And I know a lot of people, a lot of people, get all ornery over that. And I do mean ornery. Like, you know, oh, you're devaluing real PTSD. Oh, if you think that a series as shallow as this would focus on something as complex as that, that's just insulting. No, we saw it. Um... I am going to say, as someone who actually does suffer from PTSD, um, that is a very honest depiction of what PTSD is. Not all PTSD has you, you know, cowering under a table every time something goes bang. Not all PTSD is something that has you constantly fearing, you know, triggers and everything. You can have a very, very specific trigger for your anxiety when you have PTSD that you normally wouldn't encounter. So you could operate just fine, but when it comes back, it triggers it. And in Krillin's case, it was seeing Frieza again. 
And when he saw him again, it, it just, he froze. He started shaking. He remembered how easily he had just been straight up murdered in an extremely painful manner. A lot of people don't realize how, how painful and horrible a death that was. He didn't just get lifted up into the air and then exploded, no. That tiny little speck of energy not only robbed him of control over his own body, he couldn't even land. He was held up in the air against his will, flung into it at breakneck speed. And not only did that to him, but when Frieza squeezed, you see his body expand before he explodes. That tiny little speck of energy expanded inside him. And I don't know if you know what that would do, but it essentially would start shredding all your internal organs, shredding them, frying them, before you finally explode. Had he not exploded after that, he still would have been dead. Probably by the time he hit the ground. It was a very terrible way to do it. And then you, I mean, that happens and then they watch chunks of you rain down. Like, yeah. But that did traumatize him and it is a trauma that he had to overcome. And I know a lot of people like to argue, oh, that makes him, you know, look weak. It's like, no. Being that terrified of something, something that has you so scared, you can't even move. And being able to just sit there, face it, and overcome it is a level of internal strength that is actually... Very impressive. There are a lot of things <laughs> that, yeah, uh, there are very few things I think that, that you can really compare it to outside of what it is, but just the, the sheer willpower and fortitude and willingness to face something that absolutely terrified you to overcome that takes a, a lot of strength of will and, and strength of mind and that's actually very impressive and it was very nice to actually see something like that addressed it also kind of illustrated you know a lot of uh, Krillin's shortcomings tend to be a lack of self-confidence and once he got it back in himself he started whooping so there's that but uh, I also like the fact that we got to see more of Frieza. We got to see more of his personality. Um, the way he acted when he was fighting Goku, I thought, was a lot more in character. Seeing him be willing to fire shots at, at the people down there, at Bulma, at Krillin, at, at, at the, the, the observers, so to speak, just to distract Goku so he could get a hit in. Um, Goku, knowing that Frieza was kind of secretly, you know, planning to shoot him in the head while he was getting ready to transform. Then Frieza's casual little, you know, eh, you can't blame me for trying. <laughs> you know, that that's a side of Frieza that, that's, that's that old brutality, that old sadism coming back. Which, uh, as much as I do love the movie, I thought was a little under-demonstrated, uh, primarily probably due to time constraint. I ain't gonna lie, the movie has the series like all kinds of beat in terms of fight choreography, animation, yeah. Of course it will, though it's a movie. But I do love what the series brought. And I don't think you have to definitively love one and reject the other. Summarily, I also don't necessarily begrudge anyone who doesn't want to watch either arc and sticks with the movies, simply because... Other than Ginyu appearing, being uh, Ginyu appearing and um, and uh, Tagoma, and what happens with him, which I also think was kind of cool, uh, and I'll get into that in a second. There's really not a whole lot I think that that would impact it story-wise going forward. It's it's all like details. So, like if you want to skip that and then just like look up character clips on YouTube, I, I guess I wouldn't begrudge you that. But I will say, I do not think those two arcs were garbage, especially especially compared to what came after that. Um, uh, 
I, I really did not like that Universal Tournament arc. Uh, it, it, it tried to have all the fun of an old Dragon Ball arc and yet completely missed what made those arcs fun in that it was everybody getting a shot. I mean, when you get right down to it, that arc, even though it was supposed to be a tournament arc, was still about nobody but Goku and Vegeta. I mean, you had the perfect opportunity to have like characters of different levels of strength. Okay. And bring in all these characters from this universe of different levels of strength. And see them match up against each other. And you could have like a real tournament going again. But instead, what do we have? Uh, Boo's disqualified because he can't even write his name. Um, Goku gets knocked out via cheating. Piccolo gets knocked out via cheating. Vegeta exposes to cheating. But because the guy cheated, Goku's allowed to re-enter the tournament. Vegeta wins, Vegeta wins, Vegeta wins, then Vegeta loses, then Goku fights the guy to basically a standstill. Goku, however, forfeits because he wants to see Moanaka fight. Hit then forfeits because he wants to face Goku again. And they win by default, and then it turns out Moanaka has literally no real power of note whatsoever. It was just, it really lost what made that arc fun you know and the whole oh there were you know there weren't stakes i mean there were but there weren't you know and while it was nice to see that champa as much as he uh, and, and beerus as much as they hate each other or seem to you know beerus still did something nice for his brother that that's touching and all but it, it just like, for all this talk of all these filler arcs, which are technically kind of filler and yet not, which is kind of weird, but interesting. I, I, I like them because they're like character pieces. Um, for all that talk of, uh, you know, filler arcs, so that one honestly felt like a big filler arc, too. And only now are we seeing any kind of continued repercussions from it. Uh, we have that universe survival arc coming up, which is apparently every universe has to send a, a, a squad of the strongest that they have. It's going to be like a, a team battle system. I'm not sure how that's going to work. But, uh, and we also, you know, we got hit back now. Spoilers, I guess. <laughs> Uh, I'm not going to get into what's happening there. I will say this. Never read Japanese episode descriptions because Japan got no chill about spoilers, man. None <laughs> whatsoever. <coughs> like, um... I don't know if it would technically be a spoiler to uh, mention this. Uh, so, um... I'll, I'll just say this now. Skip ahead about ten seconds from, uh from uh, right about now if you want to avoid spoilers. Okay, here we go. Now, Hit apparently basically kills Goku in the new episode, but the episode description already spoiled that Goku basically accidentally defibrillates himself with one of his own blasts that hits himself. Okay, spoiler over. Um, yeah, it's it, it's stuff like that. They, they just reveal... <laughs> Way too dang much in in those episode descriptions. Sometimes that's cool, just because it, it, it's cool to you know kind of put some of those really weird and wacky fan theories to rest. Other times it's it's annoying, you know. Like for this, this is a short uh, arc. It's not even a proper arc. It's a two parter. So to spoil something like that. Uh, I don't know. I mean, I guess technically no one's forcing you to read it, and you'd have to go looking for it. But, like, sometimes, you know, you read episode descriptions here to, uh, you know, see what the episode's about, see if it's another filler episode, is it worth watching. But then, whoopsies, nope, we're, uh, we're spoiled. <laughs> uh, that does get annoying. But, um, I will say this. I have never seen anything quite so, have quite so much potential, and then just pull the rug right out from under it, as I did with that, that whole arc with, um, with uh, Goku Black. 
that started great it did and then it's like they just kind of ran out of stuff to do and then I mean in the end they did kind of pull it out at the last second but that thing started eating itself <laughs> and uh, Trunks is Trunks is heavy in the Gary Stu department if you want to point to any Dragon Ball character with Gary Stu status you can now forever point to future trunks because that was ridiculous you know you see the you see the the mafuba performed and you can instantly learn it in like two tries you somehow have a spirit bomb already preformed for you and you absorb it into your sword and slash the bad guy and seemingly destroy him when two god level beings fuse together only managed to hurt him and i know that they're going to try to angle it like well see it was because they had managed to significantly injure him that that worked but it's like he's on a level so much further down than they are and that even if it had the properties of a spirit bomb is made up of such a significantly lower population of the earth than like say the one that went against boo who is uh, apparently significantly weaker than then fused Zamasu there. That uh, there's really no way that should have worked, and they kind of pull it out in that it does almost seem like Zamasu wanted that to happen, or that it didn't really affect him because then he was free to actually try to merge with the universe. But that got weird, and then Zeno comes and destroys the entire universe, and then they take that Zeno into the present time to meet the current one, and then they become friends forever. So that's going to be kind of interesting. And suddenly we're polytheistic. <laughs> uh, I mean, I guess it's technically the same. One. I don't know. But um, yeah, that, that, that did throw a lot of its potential right out the window. And honestly kind of made me not like a character that I always used to like. And that irks me. It also, though, has the distinguishment of being the first story arc that Toei specifically requested Toriyama do. It, it apparently wasn't even fully his idea. They just wanted future drunks in there again, because he was suddenly marketable again. Um, so, yeah. Uh, I will say this, though. The super manga is complete trash. That thing is complete garbage uh toyotaro i do not know what he's doing he's essentially treating the super manga like his own canonical or loosely canonical rather af official af rather in that he was supposed to be adapting the anime and then he stopped adapting the anime and basically decided i'm going to tell my own version of things and um he kept the the original super saiyan god form and basically made it his super saiyan 4 uh, Super Saiyan Blue is his Super Saiyan 5. Um, he had Trunks as a Super Saiyan 2 get literally the same level of strength as Goku as a Super Saiyan 3. Literally just because he decided he needed more power. I mean, Trunks decided he needed more power. He wasn't satisfied with the level of power that the Super Saiyan 2 form gave him. And it's like... You do know, Toyotaro, that, that, that those things work as a multiplier of your base level, right? There's there's no way to make each form inherently stronger. And that if he was stronger as a Super Saiyan 2 than Goku was as a Super Saiyan 3, or as strong, rather, enough to push Goku into God Mode real quick, just because he was getting angry that he was getting, you know, matched... Which is another thing they point out in the manga, which is very much not Goku. Um, then it's like Trunks shouldn't be coming to Goku and Vegeta for help. Because Goku and Vegeta in their base forms would be significantly, like, way weaker than Trunks. And he'd have no way of knowing that those two had achieved any kind of level that was so much higher than what he had right now you know 
No real way to know that. Which, um, and and it's it's just it's continuing. He kept promising, you know, he'd get ahead of the anime again, guaranteed it, and yet he's still not done with the Goku Black Arc. Goku Black Arc is uh, done in the anime. We're in like a big, like I wouldn't I wouldn't say big stretch of filler, but a stretch of filler, both because of the holidays. Which allows them, I think, to save up budget and animation quality for this tournament arc, which is going to have a lot of fights, which are significantly harder to animate, and uh, allows the manga some time to catch up and or get ahead. Um, the fact that he's barely ending it, he, he's going to have to end it next month, and then the next arc starts, anime is going to get right ahead again. So... He's, like, working on his own timetable. I, I don't know what he's doing. I really don't know. Um, that said, uh, getting to Goku, and specifically, he's been the chief complaint. I've seen a lot of people say that Goku is treated as being significantly more stupid than uh, he is otherwise. I don't agree with that. And I will say this. If you have a problem with his characterization in the anime, yet you keep, you know, talking about how the manga does it so much better, and yet stuff like that is in the manga, where Goku essentially pops into yet an even higher form, just quick enough to kick Trunks in the back of the head and then drop out of it like he was never in it. You know... And, and even Beerus and Whis and even Vegeta are, like, acting like that was dirty. Like, come on. <laughs> I will say that Goku, I think, does have some of his airheaded qualities exaggerated at times for comedic effect. But I don't think it's entirely out of character. Um, again, this is, by and large, a fan service show. Uh, I don't think it's irredeemably out of character. I, I do think that most of the time I see it applied, it is when he's not in combat. Uh, the, the worst cases, the worst defenders in that regard, uh, probably is the Goku Black arc. And even then, I guess it's, it's maybe somewhat understandable. Especially with, you know, having to jump forward in time, back in time, forward in time, back in time. But... Um, I think that that's more a, a small thing. I don't see it being a significant thing that continues. And uh, I don't really think it's terribly out of character. Again, Goku can be pretty airheaded, flighty. I don't want to say stupid, stupid. Just, you know... He, 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 he's kind of aloof. He, he's always got his mind, like, elsewhere. Which is actually a trait of the Monkey King of Journey to the West. You know, he's always just kind of zoned out a bit. His mind's on other things, you know. He's, well, got sort of a form of, like, ADD. <laughs> he's got a very short attention span at times. It's... It's, I don't think, a, a big problem, no. In fact, I, I don't even really think it's necessarily a problem at all. Um, boy, I, I, I would have prepared for this video a little bit better, I think. But there's another video that I want to make yet tonight. I've also got a scratchy throat, so uh, forgive my, my voice kind of being noticeably a little scratchy. Um, seems like I always have an itchy throat every time I need to do a lot of the talking. Just like, um, just like whenever I want to write something, I swear to God, only happens like in the middle of the night when I'm supposed to be asleep. And I really can't afford to lose the sleep, so I haven't gotten to any writing done in a long time, and boy... But yeah, so no, in the end, I really do not think Super's trash at all. I don't buy this argument that it's got just as many, if not more, problems in GT. It really, really does not. 
I see a lot of people say GT had amazing ideas that were just executed poorly. Not really. It had a lot of ideas that were basically borrowed from filler. The Shadow Dragons didn't even make sense in their incarnation, and that's supposed to be the big arc that was so good. And it's like, these Dragon Balls aren't even the same Dragon Balls anymore. They were remade by Dende. Um, you know, the Namekians never had this kind of problem with Perunga. So why is it a problem with Shenron? Why is it a problem when they've allowed those Dragon Balls to sit there often longer than their one year limit? You know, how, how are they overusing them? If there was supposed to be some limit on how often they could be used, why didn't anyone say that? It's just, it doesn't hold up to scrutiny when you really start questioning it at all. It's one of those things where if you don't think about it, it makes sense. <laughs> if that if that makes any sense to you. <clears throat> but, um... Yeah, uh... Uh, so, in conclusion, no, I, I don't think Super is trash. Um, I'm not going to say that it's, oh my god, amazing, per se. I think it's great. I do love it. I love the crap out of it. Um, I understand if a lot of people think it's not what they were looking for, but to that end, I would also ask, what exactly were you expecting? <laughs> I mean, this is, a, a, again, a contained series. We already know what it ends with the end of the manga. So, I don't know. I will say this, though. I'm very much looking forward to finding out, if we do, why exactly Goku was so eager to go train Oob. Like, are Goku and Vegeta getting to the end of their, their youth, per se? Because the thing about the thing about Saiyans is, again, a lot of people do think that Saiyans, you know, essentially live significantly longer than humans. And yet Akira Toriyama, not too long ago, clarified that Saiyans actually don't have a much longer lifespan than humans. They just have a much longer youth. They they remain in their prime for a significant period of time, and then once that time period is up, they do start to age, and they do it apparently pretty quickly. So, and I mean, we have seen Goku and Vegeta go in that time chamber, you know, stay there, you know, for a while. Time is passing here. So maybe that's the case. Maybe Goku just wants to pass on what he knows and get in that one last good fight before he's no longer able to. Who knows? Maybe that'll even be explained. Again, who knows? But I, for one, very much like this series. Uh, I love the characterization that it's bringing forward. I, I love um, the way it shows some of the romantic relationships. I'm not even going to lie. Uh, I love the way it's showing that uh, 18 wasn't that, you know, emotionless ice queen everyone kept making her out to be. That, that, that alone, to me... <laughs> is like a huge piece of characterization that is like vitally important I think to understanding a lot of decisions she made and honestly I can't wait to see where it goes and hopefully hopefully it stays you know good <sighs> at any rate uh, that'll do it for this video um, if you guys have any other topics you want me to talk about at some point, you know, feel free to ask me. And uh, I will catch you guys in the next video that I'm about to record, which has to do with the Power Rangers movie. Oh boy, I'm going to get flamed for this. See ya.